Welcome this afternoon to a very special afternoon to our uh, collaborative research center. Um, we have a hybrid meeting, so few of them are sitting and watching uh, what's going on here. It's a very special event, and uh, once a year, uh, the CRC um, awards the Calagos Möbius Award, uh, worth of 10,000 euro to an established uh, scientist in our in our field of uh, symbiosis and. Uh, before I introduce you the this year's awardee, uh, Professor Nancy Moran, um, why do we do this, and uh, what is the name of this uh, of this um, of this prize? And uh, we are doing that for the simple reason that uh, the future of um, our field is an interdisciplinary and integrative um, approach, and um, all our awardees are are. Um, working in a very integrative and uh, interdisciplinary manner. Uh, and this year's Sarwadee Nancy Moran, she's professor for integrative biology uh, in, uh, in tech at the University of Texas. So um, another very clear uh, um, case for that. Why the name um, for that prize? Carl August Möbius, some of you may know or some of you don't know. He was the first zoology professor here at Kiel and um, appointed by Emperor Wilhelm. At that time, we still had an emperor in Germany. <laughs> and uh, he uh, obviously was a very good teacher, but he also was a very good observer and naturalist. And uh, what he discovered is that marine mussels, which are living here in the fjord and um, in the North Sea, um, they didn't do well anymore at his time, at least in some, today we would say, ecosystems. And he, he carefully um, thought, what's the problem? And came to the conclusion that the problem is, in, our, in a modern language, loss of biodiversity on and in these mussels and oysters and uh, because of pollution. And... Um, for that reason, then he came to the conclusion that it needs a, a rich um, environment and uh, a rich uh, collection of species which are living on the shells of, of oysters and other mussels to, to make them happy and to, to keep them uh, going. And uh, he coined the term biosinosis for that phenomenon. Uh, in German, even worse, it's called Lebensgemeinschaft. And uh, this term and his work actually never made it. And I'm very happy I take Nancy tomorrow to the museum uh, to, to show her the, the book. And uh, because that was before ecology was invented, it was before uh, people realized that complexity of life forms is essential for fitness. And um, that's actually what Carl August Möbius um, discovered. And um, for that reason, we decided in the steering committee that we give once a year a prize with the name of, of, um, of this um, uh, influential, to some extent, uh, scholar here at Kiel uh, University. Um, after Kiel, in an old age, he still moved to Berlin and he founded the Natural History Museum in Berlin. Uh, so he um, uh, was a very influential guy. Why Nancy Moran this year? Um, Nancy Moran is an uh, evolutionary biologist at the University of Texas in, in Austin. and. Uh, as I said, professor of integrative biology um, there. She um, received her PhD in zoology uh, from the University of Michigan. Uh, then she briefly went to Czechoslovakia. Uh, this country is not existing anymore. <laughs> uh, and uh, then went to Arizona uh, and became professor at the University of Arizona. And uh, finally moved in 2010 to Yale University to have a professorship at Yale. And then she returned back to the South and since 2013 she's professor at the University of, Talk of Texas in, in Austin. Nancy um, is one of and uh, probably the uh, leading researcher in the symbiosis field. She was elected as member of the National Academy of Sciences in 2004, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2005. She was in 2010 awarded the International uh, prize for Biology from the Japan Society of the Promotion of Science. She uh, received the MacArthur Genius Award in 1997, and uh, earlier this year in January, she received the Salman Roxon Award in Microbiology from the National Academy of Sciences. 
she must have done a lot of work to get all these achievements. And yes, she has expanded and uh, also developed the understanding of microbial symbiosis and bacterial genome evolution, uh, which also has a range of applications uh, and uh, in terms of health of organisms, um, not only the honeybees, and, uh, but also for agriculture and uh, the natural ecosystems in its, in, in its more general terms. Uh, she always has focused on the evolution uh, and the biology of this intimate symbiosis between plants, insects, and their bacteria, combining many different methods, biology, genomics, experimental biology, evolutionary biology, uh, and uh, has used genome, genomics, metagenomics, uh, to demonstrate the evolutionary origins of uh, symbiosis, and uh, that this is a ubiquitous um, phenomenon in the world and uh, um, what does it mean to have this intimate symbiosis uh, for the ecology of the symbionts and the hosts. Uh, she in particular has characterized the distinctive gut communities in honeybees and uh, she made, we talked earlier about that and as many others do as well, but she made a non-model to a model and the honeybee today is a model organism thanks to, to Nancy Moran. Um, but it also shows the studying of the honeybee gut. Uh, what does it mean in general to have a complex community of microbes in your gut? And what does it mean in terms of general health and, uh, and fitness? Um, in a paper in Science, uh, she and her team described the development of a new strategy to protect honeybees from deadly mites and viruses by using genetically engineered bacteria um, pointing the way to the future, um, that uh, there is a way and um, technological way of at least trying to respond to the trouble of losing key species. Um, with that, um, I'm thinking of Carl August Möbius. I never met him. I would have loved to invite him to dinner tonight, but he would be very happy, I guess, uh, that you this year uh, get this, this prize. Uh, he was a visionary, uh, you are a visionary, and um, I'm very happy now to, to hand over. Before you give the talk, you have to receive the prize, and for that, we have to move over there. And, uh, so, <laughs> so um, first the official part. Uh, we have to stand somewhere here. Uh, <laughs> In honor of the lifetime of achievements and to support the long-term visit and the collaboration of the CRC 1182, um, Nancy Moran is getting the Carl August Möbius, we call that a fellowship, uh, um, today with funding of 10,000 euro, uh, today, September 25th. That's the document, Nancy. We all clap in our hands. She's continuous traveling, and to make traveling easier, we put something heavy in her travel uh, uh, pocket. That's uh, a little uh, right. stone. Carl August Möbius, Professor Nancy Moran, uh, Collaborative Research Center Meta Organism, which you may uh, take home. And to have something special from Kiel, uh, we bring you some smoked fish, uh, oh. which is chocolate. She, <laughs> she looks afraid. Uh, Kila, Kila Sprotten. And to make the whole thing uh, then as a, a decent ceremony, um, we bring you also a bunch of flowers. Uh, so congratulations, Nancy. Thank you. Uh, maybe, yeah. We do the photo later on. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> so with that, um, we all wait now for Nancy Moran's uh, presentation, and uh, she will give an overview on symbiosis and... Uh, the past, the present, and the future of symbiosis. Thank you so much for coming. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I hope I can live up to this introduction. Thank you, Thomas. That was really nice, but challenging to um, have all those things said. But thank you very much. I've really had a delightful time so far here in Kiel, the, the, the place itself, but the, um, the group today talk, had a lot of great conversations with different people. So you have a really special group here. It's not 
many places that have this emphasis on symbiosis and interactions. It's quite a rare thing, so it's something special and it's really fun to be here. So today I'm giving this very general talk. It's um, not, not focused on just what's latest in the lab, but kind of a general overview of symbiosis in insects. And, and I will cover kind of a broad spectrum, but then give some examples that come from work in our lab over the years, a little bit of it more current, and, and then um, try to bring things together. And it's a very diverse topic. Yep, okay, good. Um, all right, so the world of insect bacterial symbiosis, what we have and have not learned. And I wanted to start with just some thoughts about what drives symbiosis between bacteria and animals. If you think about bacteria, they have all these capabilities. They can um, use all kinds of sources of carbon and nitrogen. They have um, many different biosynthetic pathways. They can make all, new, all, all required compounds. They can digest lots of things, all kinds of enzymes. Um, they make all kinds of toxins and bioactive molecules that can kill other organisms. And they have this wonderful um, ability for horizontal gene transfer to take up DNA from the environment and, and to insert it into their genomes and do new things. So they're always inventing new things. But if you look at animals, they have very, lim very limited metabolic potential. Um, they basically lack many genes for making essential compounds. They have to get them as nutrients in the diet. And that's true of animals generally. Um, and they have just limited abilities for breaking down compounds, so especially plant polysaccharides. And they do have horizontal gene transfer. It's one of the kind of surprises uh, um, in, from genomics, but it's rare compared to bacteria, which do it as a daily habit. Animals only rarely do it. So what this means is just automatically some things that bacteria can do um, for animals. One is nutrition. They can make nutrients that animals need in their diets. Um, one is defense. They can make toxins that animals can use to defend themselves. And um, another is that bacteria are a source of information, or microbes generally, but I'll talk about bacteria primarily. Um, they're reacting to the environment, they're putting out cues, they're giving all kinds of information about the environment that can be useful to an animal, which is relatively slow responding and, and slow generation time. And this is often important in the development of animals. Animals have these different cell types, different tissue types, different developmental stages, and they can interact with bacteria to sort of guide their development um, as they go through their complex, relatively complex life cycles. And so we see that a lot, that bacteria are important in development as a source of information and interactions um, beyond just their basic provision of nutrients and, and maybe protective molecules. So, um, I don't know how to get rid of that little thing. Oh, well. um, so insects. So I, I mainly have worked on insects, as, as Thomas said, and insects are incredibly diverse. As you know, they are more than half of all species described and probably half of all species that really exist. They originated a long time ago along with terrestrial ecosystems in general, um, moving on to land. Um, they were, the symbioses of insects were rarely studied um, more than 30 over 30 years ago. It was known they were there, at least some of them were known, but no one studied them. And the main reason is that many of those microbes are not culturable. And so the tools for studying them, there just basically was no real way to study them or even know what they were. It was only microscopy. You could see that they were there, but that was it. And then since around, um, since around 30 years ago, but especially since about 2007, which if, if you remember, um, those of you old enough, that's when next-gen sequencing started. There's been this ex just explosive increase in studies of symbiosis in general, but insects in particular. Many people around the globe have started studying insect symbioses around that time, looking at what's really in there, because for the first time you could see what's really in there as opposed to what you culture when you, take, like, when you try to culture things from, from an insect. And it turns out there's a huge variety of insect symbioses. And of course, because there's so many insects, and I'm gonna talk about these different types. So there's some called primary symbionts, and those are um, symbionts that are obligate for the host. They're transmitted strictly vertically from mother to egg to offspring, and they're retained continually in a matriline in the host. And they're um, 
they often have highly reduced genomes um, and all these properties that kind of resemble organelles and I'll talk about them some. Examples are Buchnera and aphids and that's the one I'll talk about but there's many other examples. And then just moving a little bit away from that, there are some called secondary symbionts, also maternally transmitted, but sometimes they jump around horizontally as well. So I'll talk a bit about those and give some just examples of these different kinds. And um, the example I'll talk about is Hamiltonella and aphids, but there's also Wolbachia, very widespread symbiont in different insects. And then there's, um, and the top two, in general, you can't culture them. These are intracellular for most of their life cycle. They're maternally transmitted. In general, it's been genomic, transcriptomics. Those kind of tools have been the main way to study them. Um, genetic tools and culturing them have been off limits for almost all of those. But we get down here to gut symbionts suddenly, and um, this is one of the th reasons I moved in this direction, suddenly you can culture the microbes, which means you can start to develop genetic tools, knocking out genes, understanding what pathways are affecting the host, what's determining how they colonize, and so on. So these um, gut microbes are host, but they don't have to be gut microbes, but these are host specialized things, but they're not maternally um, transmitted. They're normal, they have normal genomes with horizontal transfer, and um, this would apply to um, the gut bacteria and termites, for example, which are highly specialized, and in honeybees, the system I'll work on that I'll talk about a little. And then you get to just environmental microbes. Many insects um, have um, microbiomes that, are compo that really are not specialized bacteria. These bacteria live in different environments, but they also live in the insect gut. They can be important for the host, even though they haven't necessarily evolved with the host for long. So going back, what can we say in general about all of these interactions is highly diverse, are their general principles. And um, a, a pioneer in the field of insect symbiosis or invertebrate symbiosis in general was this person, Paul Buchner, a German, who was an embryologist. He was studying invertebrate development, how embryos you know, take, take shape. And he noticed that in many of these embryos that he was looking at, there was a huge amount of microbes. In fact, at some stages of embryogenesis, most of the animal was microbe. And he got interested in that, in, in animal symbiosis, and started documenting those. He studied hundreds and hundreds of species. He had students who studied species, different species. Many, and actually, most of what he studied was insects. Um, um, he, he finally published a large book, and more than half of it is about insects, but it covers other invertebrates and vertebrates as well. And this was all based on microscopy, pretty much all based on microscopy. There were some experiments, but they never knew. Sometimes something would be cultured, but you never knew if that was really the symbiont because they didn't have um, molecular markers to confirm what, what they were growing. Okay, but he proposed three principles. He's an opinionated sort of person, and he had definite ideas about what was going on that he expressed in his book, um, which was translated into English. And his final edition was in 1965. Um, and one was that these specialized symbionts are, are providing nutrients. He didn't say what nutrients, but some kind of nutrients. Um, and then he also said they are ancient. They're often ancient in their hosts. They've evolved with them for a very long time. And there's even some very rough phylogenetic trees that he drew in the book to kind of show how he thought this was happening in, in different insects. And then the final one is that in obligate symbioses, such as the kind that I'll talk about first, the hosts are in control. They, they hold the reins, as he said, and the symbionts are sort of passive things being controlled by the host. So those were sort of general things he said, mostly applying them to these obligate symbi symbionts, although he did include in his book some of the other ones. So th this is an aphid embryo, and you can see that, um, let's see what this, you can see this is, these are the, symbionts invading the embryo. The embryo is just these sort of few cells around the edge. So um, at a given stage of development, this is true in a lot of the cases, the, the symbionts are extremely uh, um, obvious and must be important. So what have we learned since him? Hopefully a lot. Um, I'll talk about this one, the aphid Buchnera symbiosis, Buchnera named after him by Paul Bauman. Paul was the first person to use sequence to characterize an unculturable symbiont in 1989. I don't know, probably none of you were even born when PCR was invented, but um, um, it made possible um, you could pull sequences out from non-culturable things and you could sequence them and put them on the tree of life. And he did that for Buchnera. It's actually pretty close to E. coli, which was um, nice because E. coli was the best known, or genetically best known organism, so that was convenient. And he named it um, Buchnera aphidicola. Um, 
Then I started working with him right after that, and we made some molecular, which tells you how old I am, but um, um, we made some molecular phylogenies um, for the symbionts and the aphids, and basically they track onto each other, they match. And what that tells you is that they have evolved together. They're sim the, the, they have been vertically transmitted over this very long period of time. In the case of aphids, it's about 150 million years. The fossil record for aphids puts that date or possibly older. Um, so aphids evolved over this period and they must have had the symbiont before, before that common ancestor back here. And so they're very ancient in the host. And um, then um, the, the next thing that happened was a genome got sequenced of a symbiont of, by, from the um, Ishikawa lab, Shigenobu, um, who's still working on symbiosis in Japan. Um, they produced this genome. This is before next-gen sequencing, so it was, there, the genomes were coming out at a much slower rate. Um, this was in the year 2000, so the first bacterial genome was 1994 or five. Um, and so this was the first symbiont genome, um, and um, it was for Buchnera of P. aphids. And since that time, there are over, believe it or not, over 12,000 papers on Buchnera. It's amazing, we should know something by now. Um, so what was in that genome? It was a surprise for many reasons. One, it was tiny. So Ishikawa, the senior PI on the lab, he had previously hypothesized that Buchnera was 15 times as, would have a genome 15 times as large as that of E. coli. It turns out it's 1 15th the size of E. coli. So, um, so it was much smaller than expected. Um, it's, you know, 15% rather of E. coli genes are present in it. It turns out it's, the genome looked like an E. coli genome, except highly reduced. So it didn't have any new symbiosis genes. It didn't really have any novel genes, just a few. And it turns out really there's only two sort of orphan genes that are not widely distributed in other bac related bacteria. So unexpectedly, it's not like it had a lot of new machinery. Um, it, it was just looked like a reduced E. coli. It, in particular, it had lost almost all regulatory genes, transporter genes, and a lot of other things, DNA repair genes. Um, it kept genes, though, for the things you have to have to be a cell. It can make a ribosome, it can make DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, so it still had the basic machinery to replicate itself. Um, it, it was missing a bunch of things involved in making the cell wall. It was another thing missing. But despite this really drastic reduction, and um, it um, retained pathways that are expected to be needed to provide the host with nutrients. So the aphids feed on phloem sap. Phloem sap has amino acids. That's the main source of nitrogen for aphids, but they're, they're very hi highly biased towards non-essential. That is the ones that animals can make themselves, the cheap, the sort of the cheap amino acids. And they have a lack of essential amino acids. So these are looking at the profile and phloem sap of different plant species, which is what aphids feed on. And um, basically essential amino acids, those are the ones you need in your diet, and it's also the ones that aphids need in their diet. All animals have lost the pathways for making them. So Buchnera specifically kept the pathways for making those essential amino acids using non-essential ones as substrates. And so, and it specifically lost the pathways that were redundant with those of the aphid for making the non-essential amino acids. So this was just a beautiful, like, wow, genomics actually makes sense. These, you know, it really fits, they were complementary. And then further, um, in the, Paul Bauman in his lab, and then later, um, Andres Moya lab in, in Spain, um, found um, that Buchnera has these plasmids. Um, actually, this was found before um, the, 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 the genome was sequenced. Paul found this plasmid for making tryptophan, it had the rate limiting enzyme for tryptophan was encoded as a multi-copy um, operon, uh, I'm implying that this would increase the symbiont's ability to make more tryptophan. So it had a specific adaptation for the benefit of the host. It didn't just keep some old genes, it actually has something new that seems to benefit the host. And the same was found for, for leucine, a different type of plasmid. Okay, so that was found for Buchnera. Since then, it's been shown for a whole lot of different endosymbionts in insects. These are just a few of the many examples. Um, so Wigglesworthia and tsetse fly, here's a lovely tsetse fly. Um, Wigglesworthia is a 
very similar to Buchnera, but in this case, it makes B vitamins. So these guys feed on blood, they get enough amino acids, but they need some vitamins and they get those from Wigglesworthia. Um, cockroaches have an endosymbiont called Bladibacterium and it um, recycles their nitrogen waste and makes amino acids. And then white flies are similar to aphids in feeding on phloem sap, but um, their symbiont also makes carotenoids, um, and the, which seems to be required for um, sap feeding insects. And some really complex examples um, got worked out. I think um, Buchner spent a lot of time on this one group, the Okanarinka. It was sort of his favorite group because it just had all these different combinations of symbionts. When you, so these are leaf hoppers, tree hoppers, plant hoppers, cicadas, um, and all of this set of um, sap feeding insects that are highly diverse. I think there's, yeah, 40,000 species. And, um, Basically, over time, this has been worked out using a combination of sequencing genomes, which are kind of metagenomes, basically, because you take the host DNA and sequence and retrieve the symbiont genomes, and then um, phylogenetic reconstruction. And basically, it's worked out this sort of tapestry of different symbionts coming and going. So this is a clade of insects. It's about um, 280 million years old. And it seems that there's been a couple of symbionts that mostly have been retained, but then certain groups lose one symbiont and they gain another symbiont. So the cicadas here, the big singing cicadas have a different one and so on. So there's different combinations that over this very long, it's not like they come and go often. This is 280 million years. So on rare occasions, an ancient symbiont has been lost and a new one has been acquired. And when you sequence the genomes and look at their um, nutritional, you know, the biosynthetic capabilities, you get these perfectly complementary um, combinations. So here, this is in a sharpshooter, it's kind of leafhopper, um, that's a pest on grapevines. Um, you get this two symbionts and they make perfectly complementary sets of amino acids and vitamins. So you see this, you know, it's sort of, it's like a meta-organism in the sense that together they have the different genes required for um, making everything needed. So Buchner was at least proven right on these first couple of things. The nutritional roles are really very apparent and they've really been confirmed over and over again for these obligate endosymbionts and these ancient origins. Again and again, these things are many millions of years old. They date back to the origin of cockroaches, the origin of aphids, and so on. So, so he was right about those. Well, another unexpected um, finding that came out of sequencing symbiont genomes um, is that they can be really tiny. Buchnera um, had a small genome, only 580 genes, but some of the subsequent ones had smaller and smaller genomes. The smallest one, this guy, Nasuya deltocephalinicola, um, which is in a kind of leafhopper, and it only has about 140 genes in its genome. So it's really tiny, yet some of those are for making amino acids that the host uses. Um, so it's really, and, you, and uh, actually all of the tiniest known bacterial genomes are these symbionts, um, which get just beyond what anything else gets. Um, so basically this is an indication. I mean, they're smaller than any those obligate pathogens, such as the mycoplasmas and so on. They have small genomes, and so their pathogens are living in a host. They get things from the host. But the fact that these get so much smaller is really an indication that the host is helping them out. So basically the host must be adapting to kind of support these symbionts and allow them to lose more and more genes. And in particular, the cell um, envelope, the cell wall, um, the genes for making that are gone in some of these small genomes, and that's a lot of genes. So um, this does actually fit with Buchner's uh, idea that the host is in control uh, with genuine endosymbiosis, so he meant these obligate ones. The host animals are in all respects masters of the situation. So that was his picture. And it, it um, seems to be true from what tools we have to look at these symbioses. And there's been a lot of work using genomics, transcriptomics, um, just various in situ um, uh, microscopy techniques and so on to kind of look at the life cycle of the symbiont within the host. And in Buchnera and aphids probably has had the most attention so we can do Transcriptomics, and I won't go into details, just show you um, some of the studies in general. So you can look at gene expression, and there seems to be this tight coordination. The, the Buchnera occur in these specialized cells called bacteriocytes. There's a picture of one over here. Um, they're large cells, and they contain 10,000 Buchnera in each one. 
the whole cytoplasm, so the green here is Buchnera, um, a probe for Buchnera, is filled with Buchnera. And, um, and if you look at these bacteriocytes, you kind of see different, uh, like, coordinated shifts in um, state that are coordinated between host and symbiont. They have very distinctive um, gene expression. Some genes are expressed only in bacteriocytes and so on. And in, you, you can see that in Earth, this is this, one of these embryos being colonized at a very specific stage, and people have looked at what, what genes are being expressed in the embryo at these different stages, and it's a very um, choreographed and predictable succession. So we can say that even though we often don't, we can't knock out genes in Buchnera and, and aphids are not good genetically either for CRISPR, but we can see that it's a very highly derived system where the host does seem to be in control. Another unexpected finding is that um, um, the host genomes, in, in, so aphid genome, contains genes that came from bacteria that are only expressed in the bacteriocyte, the, ho the host cell that contains the bacteria. So they have exclusive expression in that cell. So here's just a little tree showing, okay, here's a sort of siphon pisum as P aphid, and its gene is most closely related to these um, bacteria, right? So some trees were done, it's very apparent they came, you can see which bacteria they came from. Mostly they come not from Buchnera, it was not like they were transferred from Buchnera. In, in fact, they came from other bacteria primarily from this Wolbachia group, a widespread set of insect symbionts that um, has the advantage probably for transferring genes that they actually reside in, in the germline cells. So in order to transfer a gene um, to a host and have it be retained in subsequent generations, it needs to happen in the germline, right, in an animal. And um, Buchnera primarily does not live in the germline, only right when it's in the egg is it in the germline. Um, whereas Wolbachia routinely does live in the germline. So it, it, for, any, for whatever reason, the transferred genes mostly come from Wolbachia um, into the aphid. And then they're expressed in the bacteriocyte where they seem to have to do with managing the Buchnera, either controlling or supporting, but something to do with um, taking care of the symbiont. So um, this study, which was by Nakabachi um, et al. in, um, in Japan, um, showed this is the only study that's actually shown a protein import, a, a protein that what the um, encoded by a horizontally transferred gene expressed in the bacteriocyte by the aphid and then imported into the cell of the symbiont. So using antibodies to this protein, he could show that it goes into Buchnera and it's a Buchnera protein. So what are these proteins doing? So this RLPA is one of them. Um, it turns out uh, most of them are involved in making um, peptidoglycan, or cell wall components. Um, and so they're using basically back genes from bacteria to make part of the cell wall of their symbiont. This could either be a way to control the symbiont division or a way to support the symbiont as it gets worse and worse as at doing its, at taking care of itself. But um, this is just something that Tom Smith in my lab um, did, so the green are horizontally transferred enzymes that are involved in making these different parts of the peptoglycan. And um, it, he did a bunch of biochemistry on that. He's a real biochemist. And actually, the reactions they perform are slightly different from what they do in other bacteria, such as E. coli. Um, apparently, they've sort of increased um, their activity. Sort of what was a side reaction, a sort of promiscuous side reaction, has become their main reaction in Buchnera. So he expressed these things in E. coli and looked, looked at what their activities were and compared them to what, what they do, in e, what the E. coli versions do. So this is not the only example. The first case that was shown for a similar case was in mealybugs, another kind of sap-feeding insect. Um, and this was done in, by John McCutcheon, a former postdoc of mine, um, who um, basically showed that um, the making the cell wall is dependent on horizontally transferred genes that are now in the genome of the host. So the host is making um, the cell wall, or much of the cell wall, of the symbiont. And these are not the most extreme. There are some symbionts that have lost, I mean, Buchnera still keeps part of the machinery. There are cases where from the genome, we can see they don't make anything of their cell wall. The host, and those are less studied so far, but you know, it seems to be totally on the host um, to take care of that. So, so there's, you know, these are not things we expected to find. Um, and it's really interesting. 
So one thing I haven't told you about about this kind of symbiont is that they have these tiny genomes. They're not only tiny, they're very fast evolving. Their proteins evolve very quickly. Um, they, um, they have an excess of A and T in the genomes. They have an excess of amino acids with A and T in the codons. So it basically, they have um, you know, very rapid evolution and they look almost non-functional because they're just biased in these ways. And so this is a tree and an older tree, but this is a tree of all bacteria, right, with different bacterial clades and different colors. These long branches here, so this is a protein-based tree, an amino acid-based tree. These long branches are insect symbionts. They're, they go crazy with, in, in terms of their, their rate of evolution of these genes. So, um, but they're still functional, and in a few cases that's verified, but obviously they have to be functional because these are ribosomal proteins and you know, required genes. Um, so what are the features of these genomes? They, they lose genes. I didn't mention they never take up genes. There's no horizontal gene transfer into these genomes. They don't have phage. They don't have mobile elements. Um, and they have this fast protein evolution genome-wide. The um, proteins are thermally unstable. And they have um, extremely high expression of heat shock proteins, which is probably a counter adaptation to kind of keep the, you know, the proteins working and folded, even though they're so unstable. So all of them um, have converged on the very high expression of heat shock protein. Um, initially, GROEL, this one protein, which is universal in bacteria, um, before sequencing um, Ishika the Ishikawa lab um, in Japan, thought, oh, this is, they, they named it Symbionin. It seemed to be the symbiosis protein. It turned, it's just GROEL, and they make a lot of it. As, um, so, and that turned out to be true again and again. In fact, to express Buchnera proteins in E. coli, if you want to make, it, make the protein, you have to overexpress GROEL in, in order to get a functional um, protein. So, you know, that's just a, another thing. So, so um, these proteins are, you know, thermally unstable, and the result is that Buchnera is very heat sensitive, and it actually is, um, it's actually limiting where the, where the aphids can live. And so we can look at, if you give heat, you see the Buchnera titer drops, and the um, aphid survival drops, and that does seem to be a result of the Buchnera being gone. We, did, we figured out some experimental techniques with Buchnera, and one is that we can transfer from one matriline to another. We can replace a, a resident Buchnera with another one from a donor. And doing that, um, we did some experiments replacing a more heat-sensitive Buchnera. It had a single base change from the other one, so they're almost identical. It was in the promoter of a heat shock protein with a more heat tolerant one, and, you, and basically you completely restore aphid fitness. So it, the fitness of the aphid, it has to have the, book, the healthy Buchnera or it's in big trouble, and um, heat is basically not on their side. Okay, so we talked about this at, at lunch with <laughs> the grad students and postdoc. Is Buchnera an organelle, um, a meta-organism, a hologenome? And they have this quote from Joshua Letterberg. So people have been grappling with these this way, way back when DNA was still just being worked out as the hereditary material. How then cell would choose the boundaries of the gene complex that constitutes an individual organism? This was the same paper where he invented the word plasmid. Um, so um, it's a problem, you know. Genes are moving around between different cells and different cell types, and how do you, um, and organisms are moving around. And in a way, I don't really care what you call it, you know, just we can understand what's happening and um, people use these words in slightly different ways. I think the main thing is to define it as you're using it um, and to really consider what the reality is rather than what the label is. But they do differ from mitochondria and plastids in some ways. Like I said, they retain genes for all the machinery for replication, transcription, translation, which includes all the ribosomal proteins. Um, the host um, encodes very few genes that are required by the symbiont, just these, mainly these cell envelope related genes. Um, and then these symbionts actually exit the maternal cells. They make their own journey into the progeny cells, um, which is different from mitochondria, which are always intracellular. So that's a slight difference too. So they have a bit more independence as separate entities. I sort of have the rule that if it still makes its own ribosome, it's an organism of its own. Because a lot of things you can't culture, so that by itself that doesn't make it an organelle, right? That's true of most of life. You can't culture in pure culture. So um, I, I don't want to call them an organelle just because we can't culture them separately from other organisms. 
All right, so I, I spent the most time on that first category, so, but um, just a little bit different, um, but, but inter it, actually the consequences are, are massively different, are these secondary symbionts. They're still transmitted maternally. Buchner studied a whole bunch of them with the microscope, but we now know that they sometimes jump horizontally and they're optional for the host. In fact, when you first started looking at P. aphids, the first way I got interested in these, we collected some P. aphids from one bush in one field, and it turned out the different lines, there were like four different of these faculty. They were really diverse. They all had the Buchnera. It's all like pretty much identical, but, um, but they had completely different facultative symbionts in these different lines. And so it seemed like, well, oh, something is sort of maintaining this diversity, something very dynamic, something that is changing in the environment. And so um, examples are Hamiltonella, which I'll talk about, and then Wolbachia, which is another uh, in this category. And um, Hamiltonella defenses this facultative symbiont. It also inhabits a bacteriocyte. So here we have Buchnera in green, Hamiltonella in pink. It's also free in the hemolymph. It's a different shaped cell compared to Buchnera. And it's maternally transmitted in eggs. It basically, these symbionts have sort of piggybacked on the Buchnera transmission route. They sort of jump in at the same time, at the same moment of embryonic development and sort of enter, enter the aphid through that same route. And Hamiltonella, what it does, we figured this, so I had the idea they're hyperdiverse, they're doing something, it's probably natural enemies, which was at the time a totally wacky idea because no one, I mean, it just, but we got some money also with um, Molly Hunter, a colleague who, at Arizona there, and tested whether it was protective against a natural enemy, and we chose this thing. Molly worked on parasitoid wasps and knew how to maintain them. And so this aphidious irvi, this little wasp, it lays the egg in the aphid. The, the larva grows up in there. It tries not to kill the aphid until it's ready to pupate itself. Then it kills the aphid, turns it into a little shell, and then the wasp comes out. Um, so it was already known that aphid populations, so these are P. aphids. Um, each one is a different P. aphid clone. And these are all collected in a field in New York. And they have highly different levels of susceptibility to aphidious irvi. Some of them um, are almost completely immune. Others are almost completely killed. And this was just assumed to be genetic variation in the aphids. That was the normal way to think about it. It was, it was a permanent feature of these different clones, um, and it was assumed to be genetic variation in the aphid. And it was of interest in part because it really affected whether or not biocontrol using this um, wasp would be effective. Um, so if they were up here, um, if they were over here and almost completely immune, it's not going to work. If they're over here, it would work. So there was some interest in that. And um, a nice thing about these secondary symbionts is we can rather easily transfer them between different aphids. So we can take um, uh, aphid that, P. aphid that has Hamiltonella, just take some homogenate of its um, body fluids and inject them into one that doesn't, and it'll be Hamiltonella positive, and it's maintained very long time for years in the lab. So we can compare genetically identical aphids with and without the symbiont, which is something that relatively easy to establish. And so working with Kerry Oliver was a grad student at the time, and he um, was a really great experimentalist. And, um, he basically took the same aphid background called 5A, so one aphid background, and without Hamiltonella, they're very susceptible to, to the wasps and they're parasitized. Um, and then he, he, with this Hamiltonella, they're also very susceptible to the wasp, but then with these two, they're highly protected. So what's going on? What's the difference? And it turns out there's another player in here, and it's, um, it's this bacteriophage called APSE, Apism secondary endosymbiont phage. And um, this bacteriophage is a phage of Hamiltonella, and it turns out that it is what is giving the protective effect. So it's, it's basically, um, this is just an EM. This was the original people who discovered it, um, Vanderwilk et al. They didn't know which secondary symbiont was before Hamiltonella was known or had a name. Um, so it was just a secondary endosymbiont, but it turns out that um, we, with more work and a lot of, mainly by Kerry Oliver um, um, and a couple of others, um, it turns out that these phage are hyper variable. So these are, they have these little gene cassettes. So, you know, most of the genome will be similar between the different phage, but they have these cassettes which are totally different. And they're these different toxin genes. So a bunch of actually known toxins, so shigatoxin, homolog, 
cytolethal distending toxin and this YD repeat toxin. Different ones have different um, toxins. So it's hyper variable. It's sort of like, it's like an arms race where um, it, it turns out that the wasp can actually evolve to overcome one of these toxins. And so long story short, there's this kind of very, very dynamic um, arms race between on one side, um, the aphids, Hamiltonella, and the phage, and on the other side, the wasps. And the, if you go out in the field and you just screen for who has APSC and who's susceptible, it was just, it's, it, it's very highly predictive of who's going to be resistant to the wasp. And um, then in the lab, we found that if you eliminate APSC, so just through drift, you can isolate clones that they still have Hamiltonella, but it has lost the phage. Um, and when it loses the phage, it totally loses protection. So it's very clear that it's the phage and presumably these toxin genes. Okay, well, I mentioned Wolbachia is also in this category of symbionts, and it turns out, so long, for a long time, Wolbachia was thought to just play these reproductive tricks, and that was all it did was infected males would sterilize females. Well, it turns out that um, actually it has another major phenotype, one that's much easier to explain in terms of how selection works. It helps the females have more babies. It, it protects them and is, again, defensive. It protects them against RNA viruses. And this was first found in Drosophila by Luis Teixeira and also the Scott O'Neill group in Australia on the same, oh, almost the same month they discovered it independently. Um, and so you have um, your um, uninfected line in black here and the ones with different Wolbachia have much higher survivorship, some of them, um, to these different viruses. These are two different viruses. And here's the controls. And an interesting thing is, so this is a control ringer solution. Um, and the interesting thing is the most protective Wolbachia actually are costly when, um, when the virus is not around. And this is something that's found pretty often that these facultative symbionts are actually costly. They're actually deleterious if that environment, namely, say, this pathogen or parasite, is not in the picture. So I just want to talk about this one other system. This is new stuff in the lab. Um, Jerry Maeda, grad student. So, Fukatsuya, sort of like Hamiltonella, facultative symbiont, seems to protect against fungi. There's, um, this has been shown by Jerry and also other people. On a plate, if you take the mashed aphids with and without Fukatsuya, it has an antifungal um, prop properties. It, it kills off fungi on a plate of different types of fungi. Um, but it um, also has a bad effect on the aphids, especially at higher temperatures, which aren't that high, 20 degrees it causes all these deformed embryos. So it's a crazy combination. It protects, but it also messes up aphid development for some reason and causes very low fitness um, as a result, very few normal offspring. Well, it turns out Fukatsuya makes a toxin. It has a 38 KB polyketide synthase that um, this cluster, which is um, very close to some pathways known from Pantoia, actually Pantoia glomerans isolates. Um, and so basically it's probably making a very similar molecule. This cluster, um, Fukatsuya got it through horizontal transfer, probably from a plant associated bacterium. Um, and it turns out that this cluster has been studied in one of these in a lab in China, fairly recent work, determined the structure of the molecule it makes, which is this thing, Herbicolin A, this giant weird thing. And they showed this is antifungal. It protects plants against Fusarium, uh, plant pathogen. Um, and, and, and then um, here's, and here's the target, which is ergosterol. They, according to their experiments, um, it attacks this basic part of fungal cell walls. I mean, it, and it turns out that um, insects have um, a hormone that is very, very close in structure. And so one idea that Jerry has is that, um, that this a molecule, Herbicolin A, or something very similar made by Fukatsuya, is interacting with this insect hormone and messing up development at early stages and causing lower fitness. So it's good because it protects the aphids against pathogen, but it's bad because it messes up development in many of the embryos. So he's making progress. He recently got the Fukatsuya in culture, which is the first one of these aphid symbionts really in pure culture. Um, and so it grows very slowly, but he can still try to do some more things with it. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk just a little about the gut symbionts, about um, 
specialized ones that live only in one host, and then this very briefly on this. So, so um, I, my main system in recent years has been the honeybee system, so I'll mostly talk about that. But first, in general, insect gut symbionts, of course, it's highly diverse, and they don't all, some of them don't even have much of a gut microbiome. So um, Toby Hammer, for his PhD work, um, he wanted to work on the microbiomes of caterpillars and show how it determined what plants they could use and what it, anyway, it turns out they basically had nothing in them. The only thing you could amplify was like the chloroplast genes from the plant material when he used these universal primers. They just, caterpillars are just a tube and it goes through really fast. They extract the easily available nutrients and, and that's it. So they really don't have much of a microbiome. And that's true of some other insects too, some carnivorous insects, very little in there. So, so not everything has an equally important microbiome, at least you could say. So there's some that are even strictly maternally transmitted. They're almost like Buchnera, but they're gut bacteria. Uh, Takima Fukatsu has worked on some of those. Some have dense, diverse communities in special pouches or crypts. Some are host restricted, like the honeybee one I'll talk about, with trans, sort of like human microbiome transmitted between members of the same species. But some are generalists and live all over the place and so sometimes go in the insects. So you get all these things. There's sort of a general trend. Things that feed on a lot of plant fiber, aside from caterpillars, tend to have a more complex um, microbiome, like termites being the most uh, prominent example. So in, in honeybees, they have very specialized bacteria. I sort of figured this out. It was right at the beginning of next-gen sequencing. There were honeybee collapse syndrome, so we did a lot of sequencing with kind of a consortium and discovered that, oh, every honeybee has the same bacteria in it, the same dominant, and they're 99% of what's, in the, what's in, the, in the honeybee. And we've looked mostly at this community that's in the ileum, this one part of the gut, the sort of invaginated um, ridges in it. Snigrasella and Giliumella, they're two gram-negative um, bacteria. They live only in social bees. They're also in Bumblebees, they've sort of co-evolved with honeybees and bumblebees, but it's not perfect. There's some jumping around, so it's not like Buchnera. And they're socially transmitted within the hive. And um, over the years, um, we, ha we can culture them all, thanks to a couple of really great former people in the lab, Walden Kwong and Philip Engel. And we can do some genetics with them, knocking out genes, putting in genes on plasmids and things. So we can have a few tools um, that we can work with. So, like I said, they're socially acquired. So as soon as a bee starts to emerge from the hive, from, I mean, from the comb, um, it starts to interact with other individuals and acquires a microbiota. It's mostly a fecal oral route. Um, we did various experiments to show that. But so we, what we can do is we can prevent that from happening, remove the pupae before they chew out, put them in a sterile environment, and then we can get microbiota-free bees. And then we can, inf we can colonize them with whatever strains we're working with, with a mutant that we might have where we're doing experiments. So we can get these microbiota-free bees and colonize them, and this just shows a natural colonization. The purple is this, my favorite one is Snodgrassella that we've studied the most, and it basically lines the gut wall, and here um, we did it in the lab with a mono inoculation. You get this really robust um, colonization. And just a very few bacterial cells will give you the full colonization very quickly within four days. So what do they do in there? The main thing they do, really, that multiple labs, including us, have shown in different ways, different kinds of experiments, is protect against pathogens and parasites. And um, so this is one, the work by Margaret Steele, a former grad student, showing. So here's the microbiota free. If you just look at the levels of this pathogen, a serratious strain that was taken from honeybees, from honeybee hives, um, basically it, it proliferates a lot when there's no microbiome and this is associated with the bees ultimately dying, um, and it it's proliferates less when it has even a single one of these different symbionts inoculated alone. And if you put all of them in together, so this is like a defined community of isolates of several of the microbiome species, um, that's more effective than one alone. And if you just take a conventional gut microbiome from another bee, it's also more protective. So they're protective. Um, and they're, they're very vulnerable if they don't have the microbiome. So just looking at Snodgrassella, um, this one species, um, basically it protects. So basically um, if you have Snodgrassella plus the pathogen, um, you're better off than if you have the pathogen alone. And it 
turns out that if you have heat killed snodgrass ella, it gives some protection. That kind of implies that just stimulating the host immune system is giving some of the protection, but you get much more protection when you have the living snodgrass ella. So some activity of the bacteria seems to be adding to that. So um, Margaret look, did some microscopy. It seems that snodgrass ella forms this biofilm on the epithelial cells in the ileum that is protective, maybe just physical protection, forms a layer that um, serratia needs to really infect the host, it needs to um, cross the gut wall. And um, so that might be part of it, um, that it's just a physical layer that protects them. This is showing the snodgrass ella um, biofilm. It's this one here. It basically lines the entire ileum exactly in um, the whole surface. And we can you know, put fluorescent markers and sort of look at the interactions. And here's snodgrass ella alone. Here's serratia by itself in a, in a bee with no microbiota. It just goes crazy and it multiplies a lot. And when they're co-infecting, you get reduced proliferation of um, the serratia. That doesn't really tell us exactly the mechanism, but um, so I don't want to go. I only have a few more slides, so sorry. Okay, yeah. I didn't know your introduction would be so. <laughs> um, so, so this is, what is snodgrass cell, how, do, how does this work? And here, just some experiments where we can, we can look at, these are three antimicrobial peptides of bees. Um, and we can see that if you give, so microbiota free is kind of the, the, the null level. Um, living snodgrass ella, heat kills snodgrass ella, heat kills E. coli, they all stimulate production. That's what we expect because peptidoglycan is, will stimulate the innate immune pathways and, you, and the result is the um, production of these antimicrobial peptides and that's what we expect for insect immune systems. But then an interesting thing is if you look at some of these signaling genes, so cactus, dorsal, relish, are the upstream signaling genes in the toll pathway and the IMD pathway, the main innate immune pathways in insects. It turns out that um, if you look at heat-killed snodgrass ella and heat-killed E. coli, they don't differ, and these pathways are stimulated compared to the microbiota-free. But the living ones are actually you know, really quite different from the heat-killed ones. They seem to actively be doing something that is suppressing the stimulation of some of this signaling. So um, there's some kind of interaction. We don't know how. We don't know what's delivered to the host. That's really one of the things we don't know. Um, but there seems it's co-evolved with the host a long time. It's probably interacting in a somewhat complex way with the immune system. And pulling some things up and some things down, and so we're still figuring that out. But one little clue, and this is a study that Tom mentioned, and I won't go into much, but we, we've done some genetic engineering on um, snodgrass ella. We can colonize the bee with it, robust colonization, and we put in um, different, um, different plasmids that um, produce double-stranded RNA, so you just have promoters in both directions, and the double-stranded RNA is targeting um, and we've targeted different things. We can target a gene of the bee and knock down expression of that gene in the bee. We can target a um, RNA virus and lower the, the amount of virus in the bee. And we can even target the mites that's, that feed on the hemolymph of the bee. And if you target an essential gene of the mite, you can kill the mite, the varroa mites, which are a big pest on bees. So all of this, that's cool. And the thing is, it doesn't, it, it, it de definitely happens. We can find the RNA in the bee, even in the head of the bee, we can affect gene expression in the head. So how to, but what we don't know is how it gets in there. How does the RNA, it's, it's not really part of standard insect physiology that RNA can cross the gut wall and go into the bee. But um, somehow it does it. And so we've looked into different things, sort of uh, um, um, membrane vesicles of different types, which is actually our top candidate for how this is crossing into the bee. But so far we don't know. Um, Still, that kind of delivery might be how snodgrass ella interacts with the immune system, too, or does other things in the bee. We're probably just here piggybacking on some natural thing that actually already happens in the symbiosis. So this is collaboration with Jeff Barrick, um, a colleague who's been great, a synthetic biologist, evolutionary biologist, been great working with him. Sean Leonard, former student, um, and PJ, who's a current postdoc who's continuing some of this. Okay, so... Another thing the bees do, and Guillemella in particular, this other symbiont, is break down 
plant cell wall components that are in the pollen grain. So that's kind of new. No one ever knew that. And actually, they're, they get some energy from it, short-chain fatty acids that are released, which no one knew. A lot of people study bees and bee nutrition because they're so important. But this actually is a new element. Um, and we thought there was just one species of Guillumella doing this and then looking more and more and getting more and more isolates. Um, um, uh, Jane Ludvigsen in Norway actually um, figured out actually there's at least one more species and she described it, Guillumella apis, so apis and apicola. If you take the bee, you'll find they're always both present in the bee. They're very close. 16S is like 1 to 2% divergence. They're very close. Um, but they're both there. They've diverged in the bees somehow. And um, we, we did some work just showing one thing we're interested in is how does divergence, how does this diversification happen within the host? And we, we did some work on looking at their genomes and their metabolic capabilities. And it turns out Guillaumella, they have very different metabolism, even though they're very closely related. Guillaumella apis has um, the machinery for using urea, sort of nitrogen waste products. Um, Guillaumella apicola doesn't. And that's relevant because this, when we looked at where they live in the gut, one of them lives up here. And this is right where the Malpighian tubules dump into the hindgut. So if you know insect anatomy at all. Now, piggy and tubules are basically the kidneys, and they dump the nitrogenous waste into the hindgut, and then it goes out that way. And so there's this big input right here of those waste products, and this species has specialized on using them, whereas this Guillumella apicola down here is the one that has all the um, enzymes for digesting carbohydrates. The pollen, the husks of the pollen tend to accumulate right down here at the end of the ileum, and so it has a lot of machinery for breaking down all these um, carbohydrates, which Guillaumella apis doesn't have. So they separated into different niches. We don't know if these different niches are what drove the separation. There's also a lot of, um, I was talking to Daniel about it too, um, there's a lot of machinery for bacterial warfare in these genomes. They're all at war with each other and competing, and that might actually also cause them to um, diversify and separate where they live. So, but we can see that this is going on. So I just have one slide on this last system. I've never worked on this kind of system. So these are, say, gut microbes that are in insects like Drosophila and the gut microbes of mosquitoes. They're very erratic. They have different, different individuals in different locations. will have different bacteria. There's not really much of a core microbiome. It's just very different. Um, studies show that they are important to the host. Host development um, can depend on them, but they that these, these niches might not be important to the bacteria. They live in many different environments, and so insect guts might be minor in their lives. Um, but some really amazing work has been done on these, too, and um, this is work by Carrie Kuhn. She was a postdoc in my lab, but then she, this, all this work she did at um, University of Georgia as a PhD student, and she showed this amazing thing. So they were trying to grow mosquitoes axenically with no bacteria, and it turns out they cannot. They cannot develop without bacteria nearby. Um, and it turns out um, that it doesn't matter what bacteria. They can be different between different habitats. Um, almost all bacteria can ca cause this. Um, and then later, it turns out it's basically just um, they bacteria induce um, hypoxia in certain tissues or cells or near certain cells, and that is a signal for development to work. And so. Mosquitoes cannot live without bacteria, but it really doesn't matter what bacteria. And so here we have a case where, I don't know if you'd even call these symbionts, or you can, if you if you're fine with me if you do, but, um, but you know, it's a very different kind of relationship. Okay, so what have we learned from all of this rather scattered bunch of different observations on very different systems, all the way from Buchnera only living in its host for 200 million years versus these mosquito things that are, really doesn't even matter who they are. So basically, you have to think about symbionts to understand insect biology. The resistance to parasites, the nutrition, all of the thermal tolerance, all of those things are being um, governed by symbionts in many different groups. So even insects like mosquitoes that don't have specialized symbionts, they still depend on, um, usually it's bacteria, um, microbes anyway. And um, I didn't talk about them much, but there's a lot of, um, people in different labs and different, around the world trying to use knowledge of these symbionts to control or support insect populations. So we've done a little with honeybees. There's a lot of insect control efforts with these. 
Wolbachia is being used to try to reduce the ability of mosquitoes to vector dengue and, and viruses like that. So there's a lot of work trying to make use of this, and in some ways it can be easier than actually changing the insects themselves. Okay, okay well, they're very diverse, as you've seen. Um, a major distinction is that first category. Do the symbionts still undergo recombination and, and take up new genes? So Buchnera and the ones like that are really off on their own. They, um, they um, are losing genes, they're never gaining anything, and the, uh, the genes they do have are sort of going downhill. And so basically these can be a, basically Achilles' heel for the host um, because the, genome, the genomes are decaying. So we've referred to this as a symbiotic rabbit hole. Like you go down it and there's no coming out um, and it just gets you know, worse and worse. But in m many other symbioses, the, basically the gene uptake by the symbionts is a way for the host to be able to do something new because the symbiont suddenly can digest pectin, say, in the gut, and so it's getting energy from pectin, or the symbiont has a new toxin to kill the enemy. So horizontal transfer into the symbionts is really a major way that these hosts that live with symbionts are getting new capabilities. It's, it's, it's more often that the symbionts can take up genes than the hosts take up genes. So, yeah, so basically um, this, this other finding that horizontal transfer actually into the insect genome is very connected to these intimate symbioses. So it's pretty interesting that that has happened in numerous different systems now. Um, and this is something we would not have dreamed of uh, even a, well, like a decade ago. It was really um, a surprising thing. So what do we not know? Uh, one thing is, oh, there's all this diversity. Can we generalize at all? What can we say in general? And I think we will be able to say something, maybe not over all of the systems, but some very repeated patterns that we'll see. So one thing is, what are the fundamental barriers to formation and maintenance of host-restricted symbiosis? It's happening repeatedly, but it's not happening everywhere. And there must be something that prevents it in some cases and allows it in other cases. And an illustration of that, we can look at, and we can see that these specialized symbioses are actually really common in some orders and very, in some groups of insects and almost non-existent in others in terms of specialized symbioses. Um, for example, if you look at Lepidoptera, a huge order, butterflies and moths, they have, all, they have none. They don't ha have any endosymbionts of the type like Buchnera and stuff. There's many, many thousands of species of Lepidoptera. Um, and none of them have this kind of association. Whereas in Hemiptera, it's arisen many, many times, like most Hemiptera have these kind of associations. Um, Coleoptera have them quite often too, and Diptera. So it's some kind of difference between these major groups, it seems like. Um, one of them might be immune system differences. Um, and I'll just point out that Lepidopterans are where antimicrobial peptides were discovered. They have very intense um, antimicrobial peptide, um, you know, re antimicrobe responses in terms of their immune system. They have more um, families of antimicrobial peptides than any other group of insects. So, you know, maybe it's hard for a symbiont to move in if you have that kind of um, immune system, maybe. And then another, on the other side, why do these symbionts only arise from a couple of phyla of really concentrated within a, within a few clades of bacteria? So basically, proteobacteria and bacteroidetes, and really just one group of bacteroidetes, um, basically all these cases of at least endosymbionts that live inside cells come from these groups. There's a lot of other bacterial phyla that are all around that the insects encounter, but they do not become endosymbionts. They, ha they can make all the amino acids, they can do you know, all of these things that might be useful for the host, but they don't become endosymbionts, whereas these ones do. And I don't know why, but <laughs> one thought is that um, there might be a major role of type 3 secretion systems, which are widespread in proteobacteria and um, that are used by bacteria to enter a host cell. It's mostly been studied in pathogens, but it's also implicated in some symbioses. For example, the, a symbi another symbiont of T. C. fly, Sodalis, studied by Colin Dale, he, he actually showed that type 3 secretion system is required to colonize the host. So, uh, Buchnera. Um, Possibly the original formation of the symbiosis depended on these mechanisms. Some of the highly derived symbioses, maybe the host has taken over. They're no longer you can't you no longer observe what really got it started. So people studying these younger symbioses might be more able to see what gets them going. 
And then how do symbionts modulate host immune responses is another big question because all of these things have innate immune pathways and symbionts have to deal with that somehow. All right. And then the, the, a fundamental question, I, I mentioned it with the, um, how does RNA move from the gut bacterium into the host body cavity? Um, how do signals move between these? We really don't, in terms of how that really works, we almost never know anything about it. Um, so we know that things are moving, we can prove that, but we don't know how they move. So um, there's a lot more attention to membrane vesicles as a, as a major mode, so that might be a big thing that comes, that comes out of this, that we find that that's important, but there could be other things. Okay. All right, so I'm going to make the... Um, I can't acknowledge everyone. I had so many different studies in here, but I have been extremely lucky over the years to have great people working in the lab. Um, and it just, you know, they, they leave some at some point, but then other great people have come. So it's really been tremendous fun over the years to work with all of them. I work closely with Howard Ackman, who's my husband. He works on bacterial genetics and genomics. We, we have separate research programs, but the group interacts a lot, which I think is, is really um, good for them. And I just I made this slide. These are the former people in the lab. It's, God, it makes me feel really ancient, actually. But, uh, but I'm really proud of all these people who are now have their own labs and they're doing their own thing, usually on insects. And actually, more than half of them, it's insect symbiosis of some kind. So they're all over the place with labs studying different things. So with that, that's it. Thank you. Thanks.